Hey, everybody. Hope you're out there. Ian Marie Matulis, mm -hmm. Tracy's waving, Lisa's waving. Um, good evening, Ian Marie Matulis, hosting the SPSM Chat 2.0 reboot uh, here on Sunday night, February 24th. Um, we have a most interesting topic tonight um, autism and suicide. And I, I have to put the word, I have to put the word right next to it. The more I've learned and understood over this last week is, and we need to add the word marginalized again. Um, we've been adding it to so many of the topics that we've been talking about, but this one, this one's real. And I know that people are hung up on the Oscars. You know, I used to watch that all the time. I just don't even do the movies anymore. Um, but this is reality. This is the real deal. This is an important topic. Um, is there not an important talk topic in suicide prevention? I'm not sure. Um, so that uh, just some quick housekeeping. Um, when you're tweeting, retweeting, or quoting on a tweet or quoting someone, can you please use the hashtag SPSM? That would be the only one you have to use. Please greet each other. Let us know where you're from. Say hello. And I know there are lurkers out there because we, we have, our numbers have shown we have way more people watching this live stream on YouTube than we have identifying themselves on the Twitter um, feed. So just pop in on Twitter and just, you don't have to keep joining the conversation, but just say hello and like, where are you from? So where am I? I'm in Southeastern Massachusetts. Um, we're expecting a terrific wind storm tonight. Uh, we've had rain all day um, so that I'm going to, um, I'm just going to ask Tracy, you want to give yourself, um, say hello, because I know you're going to say hello and goodbye. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Tracy Medeiros. I'm a suicide attempt survivor. I'm also a law survivor. Um, I'm here with Anne Marie. I'm right down, actually, I'm right down the hall from Anne Marie. <laughs> Um, I'm also in Massachusetts as well. So yeah, please, um, anybody out there, give a shout out, you know, and I'll shout right back at you, you know, say hello. Don't be shy. Cause I'm not. No, she's not. All right. We'll see you in a bit. So I'm going to start again, um, to give some perspective, um, Anne Marie Matulis, I am, as I sit here, I am the impacted family of a suicide attempt survivor, emotionally impacted, and that attempt survivor is Tracy. Um, people brought her to me 20 years ago and said, this 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 kid's gonna die if, if someone can't get through to her, and she almost did. Um, and she is now, 20 years later, the epitome of trauma to resilience. Uh, she amazes me how she bounces back up no matter what gets thrown at her. I am also a loss survivor. Um, I work in the field. I work locally, statewide, and nationally. I have projects in consulting positions that bring me to all, to all three. I am the chair of the American Association of Suicidologies um, Impacted Family and Friends Committee. And I'm going to be introducing you to another chair of a new AAS committee. Uh, and we would both say, we will both say, if you have some time in your hands and you have a passion for what we're going to be talking about tonight, or other nights we have room at our table for you to be at. And we would love to see that. Um, as with our guest, I'm an author. I've done, I've produced a few documentaries focusing around attempt survivors and impacted family. Um, and just glad to be here. I hope you're out there. Please tell us a little bit about yourself so we can get to know each other and please greet each other too. So, so Lisa, uh -huh. tell us who you are. Okay, I'm Lisa Morgan. I am a loss survivor, um, twice actually, my husband and my, three months before my husband, my nephew, died by suicide. Um, Sorry for your loss. Thanks. I'm also co-chair of AAS's um, Suicide and Autism Committee, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I'm the author of Living Through Suicide Loss with an Autism Spectrum Disorder. I'm an autistic adult. And I have, um, I'm a certified autism specialist as well, and I have a master's degree in the art of teaching and special education. I'm actually a teacher by heart, you know, for my heart oh. in teaching. Yeah. Um, so I also write for Spectrum Women's Magazine, which is an online magazine for autistic women who, um, see, I'm the associate editor. I have a column that I really love doing. 
and I've done some feature write feature articles. Cool. So we're going to start with the author in you. Um, and I would like to share this with the audience because I'm not sure that everybody had a chance to, to, to check it out, but I'd like to read you the brief description of, um, of Lisa's book. I, I was fascinated when I saw the title um, because my first instinct was we had a huge gap and thankfully Lisa had the, the courage and the ambition and the passion to, to fill that slot. So I'm just going to read you this brief little description from Amazon. Losing someone to suicide can open up a world of pain, confusion, and grief. And for people with ASD, ASD, I'm going to stumble over that, Lisa. Um, the effect can be acute and extremely challenging. Reaching out to fellow Aspies, I found that an interesting term. Uh, Lisa, Lisa Morgan proffers her insight and advice to ensure that others on the autism spectrum don't have to face suicide loss alone. It's written as a firsthand account. This astonishingly honest book looks at the immediate aftermath and how emergency responders can help. <coughs> oh, wouldn't you know? As well as the long-term implications of living with suicide loss, for individuals on the autism spectrum. <clears throat> Something just went in my throat, Lisa. <coughs> so without reading any more, I'm just going to have to excuse myself for, for one 30 second thing. Talk to me about your book. Okay. Why did you write it? What brought you to the table to write it? Start with that. Okay. I, I wrote the book. <laughs> Really, because I didn't want anybody else on the autism spectrum to go through what I did um, right after, in the months after my husband uh, died by suicide. Um, it was, I know it's difficult for everybody. I, I understand that. It's um, the problem with being an autistic adult and going through the aftermath of suicide is it's right in the areas where, as uh, having autism, we already struggle with. So um, <laughs> any, you know, communication, uh, social communication, social mm -hmm. skills, relationships, change, um, emotions, um, asking for support is a social skill. And for people my age, we grew up not knowing we were autistic and we didn't have supports and we're not used to asking for help. Most of us aren't used to, I don't want to speak for anybody, but uh, you know, it's hard to ask for help. And I struggled uh, so much that I was, um, it actually happened the night, at New Year's Eve, uh, leaving 2015, going into 2016. It was difficult. I was leaving behind a lot and looking forward to, I didn't know what. And mm -hmm. I was just really thinking, you know, I, if I could help anybody with, you know, what I did go through, then I wanted, I wanted to help. And um, I had written before to a publisher, um, JK Publishing, and I emailed her that night. I had a contract within a couple of days, and I just I started wow. writing. Wow. Yeah. How long did you spend writing? I started in January, and I ended uh -huh. up, I, I finished in early June. That's not too bad. No, I didn't make it to go back to work. Um, it was just, that, again, just things were just very difficult. And sure. so I homeschooled my two boys, my two youngest boys, oh. and wrote my book at the same time. So when I was finished my book, that was actually um, almost a year to the date of, of my husband passing away. Oh, that's a mixed, yeah. Wow, that brings up mixed emotions, doesn't it? So walk me through your book. It, so if I pick it up and read it, what will I learn? Tell me about not all of it, but I, I'm not. Okay. You don't have to go page by page, but in in general, what are the if if you had highlights you wanted someone to take away? What would some of those be? Well, I touched on what what happened and what happened with the first responders and other um, professionals. Mm -hmm. So, from my point of view, and um, things that I could I thought could maybe go a little better if we understood each other better. 
<laughs> and I went through um, relationships and emotions and support and sensory issues that were a problem. Um, just really all those areas where mm -hmm. autistic people usually, you know, struggle. And I have from for each one, each even each little part I wrote in each chapter, I have um, help. You know what what worked for me. Um, oh, cool. Maybe maybe saw how somebody helped me. Maybe I figured out myself. Um, most of the time, people help me. Um, so just um, every everything that I pretty much learned those first uh, is is mm -hmm. in there. And um, you know, I, I wrote it with uh, hope. It's not um, a depressing read. Um, there are hard parts, of course, um, but it's written with. Okay. So talk about the first responders. What was the problem that, that you were having? Well, um, the first problem I had was they asked me to stand outside of my home when I brought the key and they told me where to stand and I found out through uh, my sensory, uh, I, have, I have heightened senses and through my own senses, I, I knew I would never see my husband alive again, um, standing by the garage. I found that out by myself. And then when they came out to tell me, um, they surrounded me and um, that was difficult. And talking to the detective, I couldn't make eye contact. I, I, tried and tried because I was taken as lying. <laughs> and I didn't yep. want him to think I was lying. Yep. Um, but the the lights on the police cars, um, it was in Florida, so humidity, mosquitoes. Um, oh, my God. The victim advocate tried to help me, but everything she did was not what I needed. Um, she was very talkative. Um, I, I was trying to regulate my emotions and things, and she... Um, had a dog and I'm a cat person, you know, it just, there were so many things that um, people tried to help. Yeah. You know, nobody was a bad guy that night or anything. It was just a different, um, different culture, really. And, then, where I yeah. needed, and they, and I couldn't tell them at the time because of the, um, you know, emotional state I was in and trying to process everything. And so they didn't know about my autism. Wow. Wow. And, and as, as, as I think about stuff now, um, I, I just so many things just went through my head listening to that, Lisa, that here you are in a crisis that can be hard enough for anybody who doesn't have the additional communication issues that you have so openly discussed. I can picture all the red and blue lights flashing and all the noise when what you need is quiet. So yes. your book to me should almost be handed to every adult on, on the spectrum. What, and how are they, how's anybody going to know that? Well, you know? I know I'm, I'm trying to get it out there, but yeah. Um, also, you know, any of an autistic person could benefit from reading the book if they want to help. And yeah. um, first responders, um, just anybody who has an autistic person in their life, really. It was written for adults. Yep. Um, because I wanted to reach mm -hmm. other adults who were going through what I went through. Um, but also, one of the favorite things that happened I when I moved to Maine, um, I gave it to a next door neighbor who is not on the spectrum and she had lost her husband to suicide about 10 years before um, I met her and I gave her the book and I told her, you know, she might, she might get something out of it. And she read it. And the next time I saw her, she, she gave me a big hug with tears in her eyes and said that <laughs> after 10 years, she finally felt like somebody else understood. She finally wow. felt like, like she wasn't alone. And to me, if, if that was the 
only thing my book did, I was happy. And it was just an amazing moment for me. Oh, that is awesome. I had touched somebody like that. Yes. So I know we're going to be talking a little bit. And I suppose at this point, I should say to people, yes, there was supposed to be another person with us tonight. Um, we are uh, so sorry that uh, uh, Amelia Leto could not join us tonight. Um, she has a medical concern at home that is far more important, um, um, taking care of family. But I just noticed that either from wherever she is, I noticed she's on the Twitter chat. She's been able to just check in briefly. So Amelia, we hope everything goes well and you get some quick answers um, and for the night. I, I hope that all works out. But what, what we would have had Amelia talking about was um, the crisis supports for the autism community. But as I'm thinking about everything you just said, Lisa, so have, and I, and I may be jumping ahead of things here, but if I don't say it now, it's an, it's an age thing. Um, so have you already started considering and talking about how to get this into the hands of law enforcement and first responders? Well, I, yeah, it's, it's always in the back of my mind, which is why, um, I don't know if I'm skipping ahead of here or anything, but why I, I wanted to start, um, I had had reached out to different organizations, AAS, mm -hmm. AFSP, different organizations that deal with um, suicide issues. And yeah. that, that was why I wanted to, um, you know, make people aware of the book, make people aware of autism in general and the needs they have around yeah. suicide issues. And so that's how, uh, that's how I went about it. But yes, I do want to get it out there to as many people. As oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do a, um, I, I've been committed to a, uh, 14 week every Wednesday morning at 8 AM. I stand in front of members of the fall river police department here in Massachusetts. For what's a basic QPR conversation more than a training. Um, and as I stand, you know, I'm sitting here now, it's like, okay, so let's see, with the grant, how many books of leases can I buy and um, put them in the hands of, so one of the things we're doing, we're giving the entire police force, that's 200 over 14 weeks, they're all getting a copy of Tracy Medeiros' book um, because it's, the, it's, 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 easy, it's an easy read for a 13-year-old who has attempted or is, or is suicidal, non-suicidal self-injury, nothing triggering in it at all. It's a very easy, you can do it in one night, easy conversation. And that's been an eye opener. And now I look at this and it's like, I just had, I just, we just had our board meeting last week and now I need to go back to the board and say, <clears throat> so some of the funds we've raised, I think I have another, I have another project uh, because be awesome. I, well, I, I, I just, I've looked at the other stuff and I did notice there were some, there were some works out there, but yours is, it's, it's a conversation. And I think that's what people yeah. need more. They don't need another textbook. They need yeah, to hear someone say lived experience. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very honest. Of it. mm. yeah. Oh, that is, that's just awesome. Um, so before we leave your book, what, I think you've already pretty much covered it, but are there any other highlights that you'd like to touch on tonight? Because our audience is probably not aware of what may be in the book. I may be wrong. They may have read it. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, that would be um, nice. Well, um, everybody go get a copy. It's on an ebook <laughs> too. Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do that, but hey, April's not here to tell me I can't. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, the book, the book has a lot of help, um, a lot of tips in there, a lot of um, successes, mistakes that I wanted people to know so they didn't make them either. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. they didn't repeat mine. Um, yeah. And I, and I think that is, and that, is that not the, the absolute personification of, um, of lived experience? Yes. Being able to, uh, we've been impacted in one way or another. Um, and to be able to say, not have to worry, please, it, 
those in, in, in Lisa, I know you do research, but I'm not knocking people who do that, that all the deep dive research. But sometimes what we need is just feet on the street, common sense of this is what I did and this is what will work, but this is what will not work. Yeah. And and please, you know, and I'm no, I'm not being oversensitive and no I'm being politically correct to the to the I can response if you are willing to understand how to better communicate with me. Would that be reasonable to say? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's um, it's really comes down to communication. Communication. That's of course. a big, big yeah. part of it. <clears throat> and not something a lot of people today seem to be too strong on. So all right. So um I'm gonna just let me just I don't see that Tracy has put in any questions. I'm just gonna do a quick tap here and see if I see something else, but I'm not at the moment. Um, hi, April. Nope. Never mind that. Uh, all right. So I am, I am not Amelia and I would never dream to try to talk of in great length about the mechanism of the, um, of the toolkit. Now I'm going to put this up. I don't know if everybody's going to see it. Let me see if they can see it. Let me see what happens when I do this. Can you all see that? Or is it? Re it's reading backwards, right? <laughs> no, I, it looks good. Is, yeah. that, does it look all right? Okay. Yep. All right. So, can everybody see that? If you haven't got a copy of this, it is so wicked easy to do. You just have to go to AAS um, or even AAS three sixty five and look for, or just Google the crisis support for uh, the autism community. It pops right up. It comes up before anything else, and we're not even paying for ads. So it was the first thing that came up. So the crisis supports for the autism community was written and developed by Lisa Morgan in collaboration with AAS's Autism and Suicide Committee and Common Ground. Lisa, who's Common Ground? That's Amelia. That's Amelia. Um, that's Amelia. Oh. Well, yeah, that's her. Um, <laughs> that's the crisis center she works at. Learn something new <laughs> every day. <laughs> All right. So that, okay. Well, that's, that's, um, that's funny. I mean, it's not funny. She'll probably say you didn't know I was common ground. <laughs> um, so I, I quickly want to, um, read to people so everybody can get, um, a full understanding on what this is. And I really can't encourage you enough to, if you can, yeah, go get a copy of this, download this. It's free. Um, and the, and the purpose of the toolkit is, workers in identifying and supporting autistic callers and texters, those who are using the 741741, who are in crisis. A person with autism may or may not disclose their diagnosis to a crisis center worker or even be aware they are on the autism spectrum. I think that's an important thing for people to know. Um, because, um, and I want to talk, I'll mention a little later that how discouraging it was when I did some research, yet still needed individualized specific support. This resource includes ways to identify potential callers, texters who show, who show autistic traits and characteristics, as well as ways to support an autistic person in crisis. The resource, resource also explains the unique difference in communication, and that is wicked important, thought processes, sensory issues, and misunderstandings a crisis worker may encounter while he helping an autistic person in crisis. And it has been endorsed by the Autism and Suicide Committee of the American Association of Suicidology and Common Ground. And then you'll have two little blurbs there on that first page, everybody, that um, will tell you a little bit about AAS and a little bit about Common Ground um, as a resource. And then you'll have... So, Lisa, you wrote this. Yeah. Um, so... I'm literally, we have more than enough time. I, I would really like to, um, uh, this is almost like uh, an education class. Um, talk to me about the importance 
of the Supporting Autistic Collars in Texas, that first paragraph. Talk to me about why this was important to you. Well, uh, when autistic people um, are in a crisis, one of the things that can happen is they regress. So adults um, who have gained skills over the years, um, mm -hmm. they, you know, in a crisis situation, some of those skills can um, lessen and, and it, it's kind of, it's difficult anyway to reach out for help if you're on the autism spectrum as well, because it is a social skill. Okay. And there was, you know, I, I read um, this gentleman in Europe, he had called the crisis line four times and due to, you know, just the communication problems, um, the, the crisis line, you know, would hang up sometimes and sometimes it, he would, I guess he might have hung up in the four times that he called, but he ended up dying by suicide that night. Wow. And then there, in the community that I'm, um, you know, just the autism community in general, like on Facebook and other social media mm -hmm. places, people have talked about just not being able to reach the person they're talking to and what they need. And I found that myself. I actually called a couple of times and once I just really needed somebody to be there to talk to. And right. they put me on hold for about seven minutes. Oh. And you know, I know I I know that happens and mm. I don't want to blame anybody or put any fault on anybody, but yeah. It just I just wanted to get something out there that would alleviate some of that misunderstanding. Gotcha. So, and, and, and I, that, I keep coming back to the one that we were talking about before we went on air. So let me throw this out to the audience um, because, and I know that Lisa, I know you're out there, Stop Texas Suicides. I know you're out there in, in um, April and, and a few others, but so here we have yet another population um, and we don't even know the numbers, right, Lisa? We, we, right. because there's been no heavy duty research in adults all well, research we, seems to focus on kids that is true but there was a 20 year study that just came out this year oh and we're not too far into the year um that uh the the finding was that um autistic women are have a higher suicide like three times um than non-autistic women and there was um, some studies done, between, you know, around between 2010 and now where they did say there's about 16% higher percentage of suicide in autistic people um, compared to the wow. non-autistic people. So it is a high risk group. It's a high risk subpopulation. Yeah. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. My take on this, I'm beginning to wonder because we began um, the Impact of Family and Friends project and committee at A Voice at the Table and now partner with AAS and have, like you, have a new committee within AAS because we were marginalized. We still are marginalized. Most people look at, at me and say, what, what do you mean by impact and family? And, and I try to be polite, but there are days where I just, I, I need to improve my response to that sometimes. Um, I'll, I, I just leave it out there, um, going along, but I wonder, I wonder in this tapestry that we call suicidology, or as I love Bart's phrase, and he doesn't take credit for it. He said someone else said it first, but it's lifeology because my life is not about suicide. It's about living beyond that suicide, having a quality of life that, that wants that life choice to happen. But now I'm beginning to wonder how many different threads in this tapestry are there. So we've got this big, beautiful tapestry we call AAS. And, and I'm wondering how many of those threads haven't yet been identified and how many more mm -hmm. layers of marginalization we have. Because when people say, well, why are pe people still dying by suicide? I just look at this toolkit for the call centers and just thinking about your book and what in in your story, and say, well, here's another whole group of we don't know how many people are not being 
properly communicated with. Um, and, and it's not because we don't want to, it's because we don't know how to. So there's a, you know, it's, I'm wondering what the next layer is going to be. So everybody out there, goodness knows how many committees AAS is going to end up with over, <laughs> over the next year. It's as we keep talking about that. Now, this was something that, that I was new to me, Lisa. So when you're talking about expressing sensory difficulties, such as sight, sound, smell, touch, can you expand on that and, and how, how that makes a difference if I'm on the spectrum and I'm calling a crisis line or a chat line. Can you touch base on, on that paragraph you wrote about those? Sure. Um, <clears throat> it could be that the person in crisis, if they could just move out of a room with, you know, it might be too hot. It might have too many bright lights. Okay. Um, it, they might be calling because of their environment um, and how harsh it is for them. So for people to know about the sensory issues is important. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. And I, I have to tell you, when I read that, I, I had to go back and read it twice. You know, I, I suffer terribly sometimes, I think, one because I'm old and the other because I used to think, I used to consider myself pretty well informed. And every time I turn a corner, it's like, yeah, no, go back to school, Emory. Um, you've got some more stuff to learn, which is cool. You know, I don't mind that. I'm just always amazed that there is so much that I thought I had that information. And I'll bet there's a whole bunch of us out there within the field that we do really good work. And we've there's been a lot of trainings and education. And then this comes along and everybody goes, uh, yeah, I didn't know that. I mean, this has one of the biggest I didn't know it's that I have stumbled on yet within suicidology. Um, social justice is right behind you, by the way, um, uh, that we talk about. So this is, I found this interesting. So that, that you may present with emotions opposite of being in a crisis and like laughter. Now I get that. Tracy and I have had a teen center for nine years. And um, it's, uh, we've done 900 kids, a lot of suicide interventions. Thankfully, all of our kids are still accounted for. But I think of all the kids who responded, what I thought was a little strange at the time when there was something serious going on and they, they laughed and they, and I recognized that was a nervous, I, I associated with the just, that's just a nervous reaction. But now I'm reading this and thinking, no, Emory, that might've been something a whole lot deeper. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> one of the, you know, one of the characteristics of autism is not being in touch with your emotions, not knowing you even sometimes have them and naming them. And um, there's another thing that's in the toolkit called alexithymia, which is not essential to be diagnosed with autism, but a lot of autistic people have it. And it's not being able to identify or really um, explain how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. So an autistic person can be, you know, really in a crisis and appear calm. That's one of my difficulties when I'm trying to tell somebody that um, I need help and I, I appear calm like I am right now, but certainly not on the inside. It's raging on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But yeah. I know. I have, you know, but the more, uh, and other people have, uh, other autistic adults have told me this too, the more I uh, feel high anxiety and, and in a crisis kind of situation, the less words I have, I don't have the words to describe okay. how I feel. Okay. And my yeah. actions don't, help either so gotcha and 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 wow because uh i i spend a lot of i think in all the trainings that we're always talking i don't care if it's qpr or if it's a talk saves lives or safe talk or more than sad or assist even um which i think is like the the top line of of a training i'm sure there's someone out there that has a training that's no no um this is even more complex an assistant I went yeah no not not if you've done the training um and as a as a former assist trainer as Tracy and I both both just share you and others is that 
watch your body language, watch your facial expressions. You know, I share this with the police department. I said, if you're standing in front of someone with your arms folded and your gun showing, I said, you've got that sour grape sucked lemons look on your face. Do you really think someone's going to open up to you? You know, and, yeah, and they true. start to laugh, you know, and they start to laugh. And they, and I said, now I realize that for them, they have to go on scene in uniform. But uh, when we're talking to just every, these trainings, I, I almost want to hold a mirror up to them sometimes and say, even sitting here in this room, because the subject matter is suicide and it's uncomfortable, are you aware of your body language and, and your facial expression? And now what I'm hearing from you is, even though they're, they're, these are callers, so they can't see you yet, but I'm thinking again on that scene with the first responders, I can see how that can be so misread. And so misunderstood. It's like, wow. And, and you know, I'm, yeah, okay. AAS, well, there, I, hope you listen, I hope you're listening. <laughs> there is an example on the night that I found my husband was um, when they came out to tell me the bad news. They surrounded me and I fell to the ground and just yeah. kind of sat there just rocking back and forth. And I believe that they thought it was the news but it was that they were surrounding me. So all of a sudden I had like five or six policemen surrounding me and I was stuck in the yeah. middle. And so that yeah. was really what at that moment, why I was, you know, in the ground, I had already figured out by myself anyway, but um, yeah, it was, there's just a, a difference. There's a difference in communication and what we need. Oh gosh, for sure. And um, is there any notice the next paragraph is about the difficulty identifying and verbalizing emotions? Um, you've touched on that. Is there anything that, um, now would that come through on a that maybe, uh, I'm not sure. Does it? I'm sorry, you, we blanked out there for a second. I didn't hear. Oh, you. did we? Oh, did I freeze again? Yeah. I'm sorry. It's okay. No freezing, Amory. No freezing. Um, so when we're talking about the dis the bandwidth. So um, the typical. I I I'm sorry. I still don't have the question. I yep. I can. There's something happening with the bandwidth. All right, let's hang on. Can you hear me now, Lisa? I can, yeah. Maybe you can ask it real quick. All right. <laughs> yeah, I don't dare. Right. <laughs> um, so the difficulty identifying and verbalizing emotion. Is there anything more that you wanted to expand on that? I, I noticed you, uh, the thought, that they are being, oh, I see, that they are being vague is, is, is an this work it should conclude. Oh, I see, because it's literal. Yeah. There's um, a paragraph is, when a person on the spectrum responds that they do not know how they are feeling, it's true. Yes. It's, it's a literal statement. Mm -hmm. Isn't that For example, interesting? Yeah. Yeah. If someone says, how are you feeling? And they say, I don't know. They, most no, I, like I said, I can't speak for everybody, but most of the time they don't, right. they just don't know. And asking a more pointed question with fewer words um, can help them to, you know, try to express how they feel. So what would be the question we should be asking then? Um, possibly like, um, what is wrong? Instead of how do you oh. feel, what is wrong? You know, um, what is wrong? Okay. What, what happened? Why are you calling or texting? That that oh, might interesting. that might seem a little rude, maybe in some direct, but yeah, it's not to an autistic person. Okay, there's there's a there's a nice lesson for all of us. Um, fascinating because even because if I am face to face, um, I can see now that if I get that vague look, um, I need to think. I need to start putting this in practice of. It may change your questioning. Yes, as as pointedly as you can get. Um, um, right. Spectrum. I'm sorry. Um, can, can do people 
ever ask would a call so the person receiving the call can't ask that question I cannot hear you. I lost you for a while That's there. That's all right. Just, just, just stay there. Just okay. I'm quit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Marie, you keep cutting out. Can you hear me I all right? Keep cutting out. I can hear you. Lisa, can you hear her? I can hear her, yep. I just did hear her. Oh, okay. Um yeah, Marie, you still there? No, I can't hear you. Can you hear me, Lisa? All right. I can hear you. Okay, so it's just her. Okay. I'm just gonna. I mean, one thing I can say too is that um, if an autistic call, caller or texter have made the step to make the call or start texting, that they are reaching out for help and that um, that's, a, that's a big step right there. Yeah, that's true. That is a big step, you know, because yeah. it must be hard for our. Uh, for you to um, to actually do that to make that call. Yes, because it again, it's a social skill. Yeah, I really got into the um, to the thing where you said about your emotions and stuff, um, like how you can't really um, tell about your emotions mm -hmm. and um, and where things happen. You can well, ask yes. about one of those. All right. I'm okay. going gonna, gonna to reboot. Okay. All right. So Amory is going to reboot. Okay. Um, um, so what? Yeah. Well, you may not know how to cope with or what to do with emotions. Right. And I had mentioned alexithymia, which is actually the next thing on the um, toolkit. And that is something where you, you just, you cannot feel, you cannot identify or explain your emotions. Sometimes you don't even know that you're having them. Yeah. So somebody who feels fine could, could be in a crisis situation um, where all of a sudden all the emotions come out at once and they're powerful and it's really hard to um, regulate them. And that's that's uh, that can be, you know, a dangerous situation, especially if you add impulsivity, which is another characteristic uh, of autism. Can be another characteristic of autism. Yeah. Um, what about the way um, the thinking and understanding um, that a autistic person has? You know, the way how they think and how they perceive the world like? Yeah, very literal. So uh, one of the examples I, I used in there was if somebody says, um, I'm here, you know, just to be encouraging. And um, an autistic people person may say, you're not, you're not here. Um, you're on the phone. And, you know, that, that can cause a great misunderstanding because honesty is really, really important too. Autistic yep. people. So 
um, that's a that could lead to possibly the call ending. Um, what so about it's? I'm sorry. Yeah. I could, no, go uh, ahead. What What about um, you know, yeah. like uh, being on the phone or or texting? Does that help at all? Texting you is know? much much better. Um, autistic people in general, we prefer to text. Talking on the phone it can be very difficult and not the first uh, way that autistic people like to communicate on. Yeah. So most likely they would text if they're going to reach out for help. Yeah, I'm so grateful that we have that, that, that yes. text, the 741-741. You can uh, text there if you have a uh, suicidal crisis. Um, mm -hmm. That that'll be very helpful. Um, so, um, so how has experienced um, countless misunderstandings and miscommunication?